name is Russ Alger. Um, the, as it says up there, I'm the director of inst the Institute of Snow Research at Michigan Tech. Um, and what that means is I play with snow. And, and I, I've done lots of projects over the years that involve um, all sorts of different things. Um, for the most part, uh, what I do is, is about half vehicle related and about half de-icer related, which is still vehicle re related, but um, so mostly vehicles moving around in the snow finding ways to make that easier. So, so it may be uh, grooming a snowmobile trail, making a snow runway for an airplane, um, or trying to melt the snow off the road so, so there's pavement there instead of snow, so, so, and, and anything in between. Um, so I've been doing that for a long time. I was trying to think yesterday when the, when the was the first snowmobile congress I came to, and if I, if I remember correctly, it was in Wisconsin. It was something like 1982 or 83, somewhere around that time. Um, so I've been coming to these for a while. Been coming, you maybe you recognize me, maybe you don't. Uh, uh, so, and then you know, I, I was also thinking about when the first first time I ever rode a snowmobile was, and that that was if I remember somewhere like 1966. And, it, and at that time, my dad did some of the same things I did. Although he went more into ice, and I went more into snow as as the years went by. But he he got a couple of uh, snowmobiles that he tested that were called snow pups. OMC was involved. I remember or whatever, there were little tiny ones for kids. They were kind of a yellowish color. And both my brother and I had one. And that was the way to become the coolest kid on the block in 1966. You had your own snowmobile, and kids could come and ride them. And so, so we had lots of friends, whether they liked us or not, they liked the snowmobiles. So. <laughs> um, the picture here on the screen is in Antarctica. Uh, one of the things I do a lot of is digging snow pits and looking at what snow looks like. Um, this particular snow pit, you see the shovel stand there in the front. That doesn't didn't get used much on this one. This particular snow pit was dug by a D8, and, and that's the fun way to dig a, dig a snow pit. Uh, shovel's a little bit harder. I've dug lots of deep ones there, too. Um, I've been to Antarctica five times. I'm headed there for a sixth time. Uh, my first time was a 2,000-mile expedition by snowmobile across Antarctica, and I've gone back four times since to do this sort of thing. So look at the snow. And, and what we're concerned with there is how do we move vehicles? How do we land airplanes? How can we make that easier uh, in that much snow? So we're looking at snow depths of 50 feet, and, and, and at 50, about 50 feet it becomes ice, and, and then it can be miles thick. So, so in, in Antarctica, there's 10,000 feet of ice and snow in places. Um, so I crossed Antarctica to look for a road to make it from the ocean to the South Pole, and, and stopped along the way and dug snow pits, not with a D8, um, but with a shovel. Looked at what the snow characteristics were. So, so what we do is we we look at the snow and we look at crystals and, and temperatures and uh, you know how the crystals are packed and what size the crystals are and, and, and all sorts of things. Density of the snow to try and predict can we drive a vehicle across it? Um, if we can drive a vehicle across it, what do we need to do to it to make it crossable? And and you guys do that all the time. So you've got this snowmobile, are you going to take a long track and drive it up through the mountains through the powder snow? Or you have one that you want to stay on the trail with and hope somebody comes along and grooms it to make that road passable. So, so, we, so we work with those kind of things. I've worked a lot with how to bump form on snowmobile trails. And in the time I've been doing that, the mechanism of bump formation has changed. So when I first, when I first built a model and said, here's how bumps form on a trail, it was 20 years ago. And if I go out and look at that same trail now, that same piece of trail, that same snow that's, that, that was, you know, falls from the sky, if I do that now, the sleds have changed so much, and the, and the way that we do things has changed so much that the bumps no, no longer form that way anymore. So the models have changed. So over the years, I've, as we've groomed, we've, we've, we've started to look at, we've, we've groomed bumps that are no longer the same bumps. And the way most of that happens is changes of, of suspension. But one of the other things, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, one of the other things that's changed for us a lot over the years is we now have liquid-cooled snowmobiles, and most of them are. And what that does is it dumps liquid water on the snowmobile trail all the time. So God's given us snow all the time, and, and we're building our own with, with these machines that we drive over the trail, and, and that water can form really big crystals, and all, which I'll talk to you about here in a bit. Those really big crystals are bad. They're really hard to grow. They smear around, they don't want to stick to each other, they don't want to bond, they bump up really quickly, all that sort of thing. So, you, so over the years, I've played with lots of snow, and, I, and, and as I mentioned earlier, it's anywhere from melting it to trying to land an airplane on it. Um, most of the
of the work that I'm doing in Antarctica right now is, is, <coughs> is building roads over 50 feet of snow and building runways over 50 feet of snow. I've built, designed a couple different groomers. I have one in Antarctica right now. I'll, I'll show a couple pictures up here in a minute that, that's made to, to build a runway on that much snow. And the trick there is, is as far as snowmobile trails are concerned, um, we, we can build them on a hard, we're building them on the ground. Snow likes that. It likes to be compacted on the ground. When I get to Antarctica, I'm trying to build this thing out, out on this runway or, or road out in, in 50 feet of snow. It really isn't supported by anything. So I call that a floating slab. It's actually really floating on something that has very little strength. And then sometimes it's not much better than the powder you'd see in the mountains. So we build this road, it doesn't know the ground is even there. So, with that said, I'll start. First of all, anybody involved with the Clean Snowmobile Challenge, I, we always have this slide at the beginning to say thank you for your support there. Um, it's really a cool thing, a lot of fun, students, great students. I think I have as much fun doing that every year uh, with the 200 students that come in from all over the U.S. and Canada um, than, than I do pretty much anything else because it's just a lot of fun to work with them. Uh, one thing I've found over the years is um, I've done this long enough that I have tunnel vision. I know how to, you know, fix the snow or do this or do that. And, and it's fun to have the students come in and have some off-the-wall idea. And, and a lot of times they're off-the-wall ideas and probably about 99 out of 100 on the mark. But there's always that one where it's like, damn, I've been doing this for a long time and I never thought of that. And I've had those things that they, several times. I was kind of come and say, well, wow, maybe if we tried that, that might work. You know, so, so it's a lot of fun. Okay, um, you probably have heard over the years that, that the, the Eskimos have all kinds of different words for, or words for snow. Well, as it turns out, they're, they're pretty much like this. <coughs> there, are, there are a whole bunch of different ways that you can uh, describe the snow that you have or don't have. Um, and, and we just so happen to have those two. So I sat down and I started to put these on the slide and, and uh, uh, realized that there's millions of them. You know, we can pack the snow, we can get dry snow, wet snow, snow that's hard to groom, snow that's easy to groom, all that sort of thing. And so, so, so the gist of it is, when you guys are out on the trail and you're either riding or trying to groom, that snow is a, is a it, it's never the same. In, in five minutes it can change from one thing to another. And that's what keeps me in business. I love that. Because there's always some other different snow and some other different problem or, or something, you know, a, something that was hard to groom or easy to groom or, or whatever. So that's kind of what's kept me going. Um, as it turns out, there aren't a whole lot of snow scientists either, and I, and I haven't figured out really if that's because we're all, the, those a few of us are a little bit nuts or what. Um, but it, it's kind of fun because I know most of them. I know I've worked with people from all over the world, and there's, it's only because there's a, a handful of us. I, I ended up in Antarctica working on this kind of thing for a reason, um, because I was a little nuts. And, and they needed somebody that wanted to spend three months on a snowmobile crossing 2,000 miles of Antarctica. So I did, because I was a little nuts. Um, so, so we play with snow, and, and, and you guys know what this is all about. I mean, it's you, you, you groom one day, and it's one way, and the next day you go back out, and it's a total different thing. It, it grooms differently, it drags differently, it pulls differently, it doesn't set up one day, it does the next day. And, and, and all of you have become, if you're groomer operators, have become experts on what can and what does and doesn't work. You know, and, and, it, and it's been fun over the years working with grooming and snowmobiles to to hear what everybody, you know, the things that have worked and the things that haven't. And that's my toolbox, is from listening to people say, you know, it, it was 25 degrees and it had rained yesterday and the temperature was doing this and this is what happened. And, and so all those things have played into what I know about snow. Um, this is uh, what most people uh, in, think of when you, when you ask, when you say about a snow crystal. And, and I call it Christmas snow. People call it all kinds of different things. It's a dendrite, it's a spatial dendrite, and there's a scientific names for it, whatever. But for the most part, six-sided crystal, it's got some arms on it. Um, uh, it's the kind of cool stuff, I don't, I, I'm crazy, I catch snowflakes all the time and look at what they look like and try and figure out what they are, um, and I've learned a few of the names. Um, but, but that's generally what snow looks like when it falls through the air. Um, and I'd say if you, if, you, if you look at snow crystals, you'll, you'll see that there's lots of different kinds depends on what's going on up in the atmosphere. For us, for the most part, we don't, we, we don't ever worry about that too, too much. Uh, because as soon as that snow hits the ground, which I'll talk about in a little bit, it, it doesn't look like that anymore. Here's a, a, a table that shows 
shows a bunch of different kinds of crystals, and, and there's lots of people that say, oh, there's 72 different kinds, or there's 107 different kinds, or whatever. I'm not sure of that. Um, but there's lots. And if you look through the table, there's, you know, up in the, in the top corner, which would be on your left, uh, is what they call needles. And you'll see those a lot. It's usually warmer. There's a little bit of a weird wind blowing, maybe out of the east. You start getting these ice crystals. Mostly arms off of what used to be big crystals. So the crystals broke up and, they can, and they're coming down in pieces. Those will pelt you and they'll actually sting when they hit you sometimes. And then there's some round ones in there on the bottom, uh, bottom right. Those are called grouples and those are the little snowballs that you see. Uh, usually happen in the fall uh, for some of the first snowfalls. So there's all different kinds of things. There's rind coated crystals. Sometimes you'll see one that look, ones that look like cookies. Sometimes you see big ones. Sometimes you see small ones. So lots of different kinds. And again, for, for what we're going to talk about here, for, for grooming, snowmobiling, these things matter, but once they hit the ground, they start to change. So it's cool to know if they're there, um, and we get people study them. And, uh, but my, my science is, after they hit the ground, what happens to these things when I want to do something with them? And, and sometimes they've been laying there a long time, and, and they're not, they don't look like that at all. This is what they start to look like. Um, <coughs> the word on top, metamorphism, basically how snow changes once it hits the ground. There's several different ways this happens, um, and it depends on what, what, the, what the conditions are, uh, how deep the snow is, how long it's been laying on the ground, all that sort of thing. Um, if you're looking, if you're working with avalanche, <coughs> you're working with, with a lot of what said, it's the corn snow crystals, I These are what they call corn snow crystals, and, and what those are is um, the, the snow starts to metamorphose morphose from the ground up, and the crystals start to change. So that nice fluffy flake I showed you, which is up there in the corner, becomes what looks like a pyramid, and it's hollow on the bottom, and it comes to a point on the top, and, the, and that snow will start to stack up on top of, its, of itself, and it has very little strength. So it's kind of just sitting there. You can walk on it. But as soon as you try to push it, it breaks because it's a whole bunch of crystals sitting on top of each other. So an avalanche sense bad stuff, and that, that whole snow mass can sit on top of that loose stuff, and as soon as it has a reason to slide, it starts to slide away. So if we're looking at deep snow, that's something we're concerned about, uh, this, this corn snow thing that happens. Corn snow can happen on the bottom of a snowmobile trail, like in some states or in the mountains where we get lots of deep snow, and you can have some failures start to happen, but the whole the whole trail will settle. So it starts to happen at the ground, the trail's up here, snowmobiles are running on it. As the year comes by, you might have a piece of snow, a piece of trail settle, and, th and this is unsettling if you're walking on it and you hear it settle, um, but it's just that happening. So on a, on a snowmobile trail, we can have that, but it really isn't our problem. Our, our problem comes from this snow, which is a different type of metamorphism that happens when snow crystals, that, that snow crystal up in the corner there, the crystal snow, hits the ground, it tends to want to become a round marble. So all those arms, <coughs> in a simple sense, the moisture starts to track, starts to move its way towards the center of the crystal. And that's what we call equitemperature metamorphism. The one on the side of the corn snow is temperature gradient metamorphism. So snow is sitting on the ground, temperature is warm here, cold up here, moisture starts to move up, pyramids start to grow, and all those cor that corn snow thing starts to happen. And if you pick it up, you'll actually see that they are little tiny pyramids, and you look at them under with a microscope, and us crazy people do that sometimes. Um, a problem in Antarctica, but not for, for us here. So, so equitemperature metamorphism is, in a real simple sense, the big snowflake up in the corner there has a gravitational pull. This really isn't it. It's sort of like that. It has a gravitational pull that pulls the moisture towards the center. So that crystal wants to become a round ball, and that's what happens. And yep, also, the bigger balls start to, pull, start to suck up the smaller ones. So, so little flakes get sucked up by bigger flakes, and, and they become balls too. So eventually, you have a whole bunch of marbles floating around out there. And, and, you, and you see this. out there, the more it becomes this thing that looks like um, like coarse sand that doesn't ever want to bond. It kind of just smears around. We, we, we smooth it out. 
hundred snowmobiles later, it, uh, it bumps back up again. The other thing that tends to happen with this stuff is where crystals touch, that moisture is moving, and it actually can bond them together. Has anybody in the room who's worked for a county road commissioner has ever messed around with uh, road mix? So like 22A sort of thing. Um, we, what we make gravel roads out of. Um, that is a mixture of gravel and sand and clay. And we pack it together and it sort of kind of sticks to itself, but not really. Same sort of thing happens here. We get a mix of big crystals, small crystals. The difference is between the road mix on the snowmobile trail is our snow tends to want to stick to itself. So crystals touch each other and what we call that is sintering. So under their own power they, they will stick to themselves. Further yet down in the bottom corner there I have what, I, what we call melt freeze met metamorphism which is the crystals actually melt. You get a little liquid water there and then it refreezes at night. So if we can groom as evening comes around and let it freeze during the night we can have that happen. Two different bonding things are happening for us. One is the crystals stick to themselves. Two is we get this melt freeze thing happening. So if we can if we can watch the weather and follow that, we can make we can get our trail harder by having it freeze to itself. On top of that, the bigger these crystals get, the less they want to bond to themselves. And and in general, that means the older the snow is, the more used up the snow is, the worse it gets. So if we have a, if we have snow on the trail that's been there for two weeks and we haven't had any fresh snow, and we've driven on it, we've groomed it, uh, we're breaking up the crystals. Those crystals keep tending to become bigger and bigger marbles. Big ones are sucking up little ones, and the bigger those things become, the less they want to stick. So eventually, you get to a point of what I call used snow, where the snow just doesn't want to bond, and it just smears around out there, and, and, and literally 20 snowmobiles will bump it back up again because it just doesn't want to bond. Um, there are ways to, to work around that, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But I also mentioned earlier that things have changed over the years, and, and that biggest change for, uh, for, for that particular thing is, is we're now putting liquid water back into the trail, and that liquid water becomes crystals, and those crystals are big crystals. So we're putting lots of water in the trail and making big crystals, and I mean, if you walk out on the trail and you pick up the snow and look at it, it's going to have crystals as big as gravel, so, and, and that stuff won't bond to itself. It, by itself, it just won't. It'll melt freeze bond to itself, but it won't bond naturally. So, and the only way to get it to bond is to break those crystals up or mix some other snow back into it and hope that that snow becomes a bond. So if you take the gravel and you can mix in some fresh snow with it, a lot of times you can go back to that road mix thing I was talking about, which now has you know some bonding going on between the bigger crystals. So what are the things that we can do? Um, like I say, remember that crystal, the snow crystals fall through the air, and as soon as they hit the ground, and sometimes as they're falling through the air, they're tending to go to those round balls, and the smaller round balls when mixed with the the bigger ones will, will, will bond to each other. Again, these crystals like to bond to each other. Bonding is time and temperature dependent. Um, it takes some time for these things to bond. And in general, the colder it is, the slower they bond. And, and there are some isms to that. One of them is cold at night, clear sky. One of the things that has to happen, happen is en energy has to move through the crystals. And it has to go, it, that has to happen before you get this bonding thing to happen. Clear si sky sucks lots of energy out. Cloudy sky doesn't. So, so you get a better bonding and a quicker bonding at night. Um, much slower in the cold. In Antarctica, uh, which, is, which is a lot easier thing to play with because I can build a road and keep people off of it for two days, which is a little harder for you guys to do. It really takes two days for my bonding to happen there. So when I build a, a, a layer on a runway or a layer on a road, I let it set for two days. And it, and it eventually starts to set up because we're working at 20, 30, 40 below zero there. 
to suck up the little ones and form bonds. Eventually they all become big crystals and they don't want to form but bond to each other. Bonds can melt and refreeze. So, so imagine all these round crystals all stuck together at, at their places where they touch. Those bonds can go away if it's warm and refreeze if it gets cold. So you can again play the game of going out there and getting things smooth when, it's, when those bonds are just melted. And then during the night, hopefully they refreeze for you. study lots of moguls and how moguls form and how the snow moves across them and, and that sort of thing. <coughs> and we I listened to the, the groomer talk yesterday and, and, you, you, and you hear this over and over again, but, it's, but it is certainly true. You have to get the old moguls out. If you don't get those old moguls out, they will grow there in that same place every time. And, I, and I've done this, I've tested it dozens and dozens of times. If there's any remnant of that mogul left from after the grooming, a new mogul's going to grow in that same spot. And moguls will move. They, they kind of gravitate down the trail, but that original mogul's here, and the, and the next one just keeps growing like this as it goes along. And that's, you know, I would say I've studied it enough to know that if you can't get those old moguls out, they're going to come back and haunt you. Um, anything, any roughness on the trail in the bottom, um, ditches, logs, whatever else, transfers back up, and, and it, just, it just keeps biting you as the, as the season goes. Extreme cold is hard, um, and, and the colder it is, the longer you have to let it set. So, so the more you can keep uh, <coughs> work at night and keep people off the trail kind of thing, it, it helps you a lot because it just doesn't want to bond. Melt conditions, again, like I mentioned earlier, you can, you can play that game of, of getting out there and getting it groomed in the afternoon if you know that temperature is going to drop and it will freeze up for you in, at night because those, those crystals will, will retain a little bit of liquid water between them touch and then when they refreeze they'll bond back to, up to each other again. And again traffic um, and, and this is this for you guys is a little harder than, than for most of what I end up doing because I can just I can keep people off the road in Antarctica or wherever else Greenland and, um, and give it time to, to go through its bonding process and the longer the better. Uh, density variations it's, it's 
best to try and keep this, the trail as consistent as you can, which try, means try and mix it up and get it packed, packed back down again. Because any place you have a soft spot, again, you'll start to build a bump. And it, it just propagates through, through the trail after that. Groomer speed, we've talked about this a bunch too. And, and, and it, you know, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a catch-22 because the slower you go, the harder it is, the longer it takes, and all that kind of thing. But, but it really does matter. Couple things happen there. You need you need to get the, the moguls cut out. You need to get the low spots filled for sure, and you need to get those low spots as hard as you can, because the, where you cut the mogul is already hard. And if, and if that soft spot, that soft ditch is left in there, it'll start to grow another bump uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so so that that plays into it a lot. Um, I, you also can get a set of bumps that form from the groomer. So so suspensions are building ground bumps snowmobiles and groomers are. And, and you can pull these two apart and you'll find there's a big long bump in the trail, mostly, in, in most cases where that the groomer makes and the snowmobile trail, or the snowmobile driven moguls are built on top of it. And they're both there. Um, so the faster you go, the worse that is as, as the groomer starts to get into its motion. You can build them off bumps. And I'm talking 12, 14, 15 miles an hour. So there's lots of things things we can can do and, and to, to try and make the the grooming last longer um, and different ways we play with the snow and it, and it really is a complicated thing and as I mentioned earlier that kind of keeps me in business because I keep playing with snow are you suggesting then uh, before the season if all our trails were like this tabletop we would have less mobile it helps a lot yeah and, and the, the way the way we've looked at this for instance is we'll, we'll take a four inch piece of pipe and bury it, leave it out on and just start to groom over the top of it. And if, if it's remnant at all, comes back through the trail, you end up with a bump starting there. And bumps tend to form downstream from whatever the snowmobile hits, so in the direction of traffic. So you'll start to build a set of moguls that follow. So, if, so every place there's a rough spot, you start to build more mogul. And, that, and it becomes a mogul field because now the suspension takes over. And without, ex without exciting that suspension, you don't really start a set of bumps. And then after that, they can happen, you know, somebody stops on the trail and, and gooses it once, and you, and you have, a, have a divot. You can start to build bumps there because, because you're now hitting that, and the suspension starts to grow. And a couple, they, they grow in a couple of ways, but the, the, major, the major one is snow being picked up by the suspension and moved, and it moves from the low spot to the high spot. So anywhere where there's a log or a divot or a dip or whatever in the trail is a potential to build moguls. So the more you can get it smooth, the better. And, and, we, and we fight, which I'm sure most people do, we fight that hunting season happens, people are on the, you know, and the road gets messed up just at the time it starts to snow, and, and so it's, it's tough, it, uh, and, it, and it's expensive to get it all smoothed out in advance, but it's a helpful thing. this stuff, um, sort of a typical drag here, uh, some blades, you know, you, can, you need to get the moguls cut, you need to get the low spots filled. One thing I didn't mention was it, it can really help you to mix the old snow with the new, and again, now you're taking those big crystals and you're mixing little ones in there with them, and you're now letting those little ones get sucked up into bond, so you can make some of the bigger ones stick. Uh, mixing cold with warm, um, if, you, if you have some warm snow below, or vice versa. It was cold and you got some, and now you get a warm snowfall on top of it. You can mix those two together. They tend to bond really quickly. And this can be a little messy because you have to get it, you have to get it compacted, get the air out of it as quick as you can, because it's gonna freeze pretty inst pretty quickly if you mix really cold with, with, with warm, but it can help you. So, so in watching the weather conditions and trying to shoot, and I know this is hard too, because we, we schedule grooming at certain times and it's pretty tough to change the schedule by hours. Um, but anytime you can mix cold with some warm or warm with cold, it can help you a lot. This is the miller of um, what we call the snow paver. And, and this is the piece of equipment that I have in Antarctica. Um, it, it is a miller. And what a miller is, 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 a, is a lot of teeth. Um, if you're familiar with a tiller, it's a bunch of paddles on a, on a, on a 
a shaft, and those paddles tend to cut up the mass. But after after that passes by, you can still have pieces that are big. So so pieces that are baseball sized can get between these paddles as you cut along. The miller is an attempt to try and cut up all the snow and try and break up the crystal. So if I can take those big crystals and smash them up and put them back, like I said before, and, and get them to bond to each other, that'll help me a lot. As it turns out, it's really hard to do that. It takes a lot of horsepower. And as it turns out, millers are relatively fragile, although we're getting much better at being able to build these things to, to withstand hitting rocks and stumps and that sort of thing. The cool thing is, is, that is Antarctica, no rocks, no stumps. I mean, there are rocks, but I stay away from them. Uh, so I'm in 50 feet of snow. I don't have to worry about rocks. So this thing works really, really well. Um, and in fact, has, has got, had some really cool results. Um, never before has a, a road been built like this or a runway been built like this in 50 feet of snow. And I did it. I did it last year. It was really cool because I've tried I've been working on it for 20 years. It's been my dream to finally do it. Um, so it's, so it's made, it, there's a lot of attention to it now. And, and we knew what the mechanics was. We knew that we had to break up the crystals. We had to get them jag all that kind of thing to make them stick. The problem was building this creature. And, and, we, and we're really close. Um, so, so what we're trying to do is, is grind up as much snow as we can. And this, this particular miller is a foot in diameter and it spins at 1,000 RPM. And it takes 75 horsepower just to turn. And, the, and it's only 10 feet wide. And they want a 20 foot wide one. So it's, so it's, pretty, it's been quite the project. But once it's all mixed up, we call this the snow paver. And the reason is that the research that I've done to get it to this point, it takes the crystals, big and small, mixes them up really well, packs them down really tight, and then uh, run, a compactor runs over the top of them and gets all the air out so they bond to themselves. And it's very similar to that road mix that I talked about before. So I'm mixing big with small, and as it turns out, that works well with snow too, and, and getting them to bond together. Some of the tests that we've run with this, and I mentioned earlier, the clear afternoon, 25 degrees, snow wind, uh, losing, at, losing to the atmosphere like crazy, run down the trail with, with in the right conditions, um, and I was I could drive with a I had a sled with brand new carbide skags underneath it, skis touching the back back of the vibrating compactor on the drag, so I'm driving right along behind the drag and having the skags sit up on top of the snow and just scratching the surface. So if you stop the sled, the entire weight of the front of the snowmobile is sitting on the point of the skag, but that's perfect conditions, and it's, you know so it's and, and I knew that, it's, but it's pretty cool. So so you can make those crystals bond. Problem is figuring out a way to do it that doesn't get wrecked by rocks, and you don't have to worry about having a 75 horsepower diesel motor <laughs> on the thing. Uh, so, it, so it does work. The other thing we, that is very important is compacting the snow. Um, I have to back up a little bit. Um, with the Miller and with the right compaction, we can get the trail too hard. Antarctica, not a problem. I can have it be too hard. For us, it is a problem. That, that played into, was another ism to this research that we've been doing, is to say, you know, if we can get this too hard, now we've got control problems, we have cooling problems, uh, we're getting all the power out. So, so it made the snowmobile thing a little trickier, because we're now playing in an envelope. We're not trying to get it as hard as we possibly can, we're playing in this envelope. But compacting is huge, and the more weight you can get on that drag and afford to pull, and like the other day or yesterday we, we heard that, you know, the harder it is to pull, the more fuel we use, the more hard, the harder it is on the machine, the harder it is on the drag, all that kind of thing. But beyond a shadow of a doubt, the more dense you can get it, i.e. the more air you can get out of the snow, the better it's going to, the harder the trail is going to make. Vibration will always help you with that. So we're putting more energy into the snow, lots more energy, than when we vibrate it. The, the problem with that is you have to do it quickly. So you gotta, you got to get that vibrator on right after you get it smooth. Get it all smooth, laid it out, get that vibrator on it. So weight is good. The more weight, the better. Vibration is even better yet. And that we've proved over the years. You know, soils people use vibration all the time, and there's a reason for it. Because the weight of that vibrator vibrating, well, the, the weight gets you somewhere, but the vibrating gets you way further. So, so anytime you can vibrate, will help you a lot. This particular picture is actually
actually kind of cool. That isn't me hanging there, but I hung there. I hung there a few times too. Um, one of the problems that I was, or one of the, the projects that I was given to, to do in Antarctica was to find out how much snow I needed. Uh, crevasses tend to build snow bridges, and, and they, they actually will spill right over. You know, when, you, you know, when you're out there in Antarctica, you don't even see them. The surface is perfectly flat, but there can be a 200 foot deep by 40 foot wide crevasse under the snow through them, vehicles fall through them. So my project was to, de to decide how, how thick those bridges had to be to safely drive a D8 over the top. So it's kind of a fun project. We dynamited them open. I hung down there and measured all the snow properties and we built a model that said, here's how thick the snow needs to be to drive a D8 across. And then I got to drive a D8 across. So, so that was kind of fun. Perched on the edge with a rope tie. Yeah, yeah, perched on the edge with a rope tie. I spent lots of time with ropes tied on me, no doubt about that. I fell through lots of how thick does it have to be? Um, it ends up being uh, pretty close to the width of the crevasse, the thickness of the, of the, of the top. And the, the snow bridges are kind of cool. They actually, they actually form in the, in the shape of an arch, and it's very similar mathematically to the arches that we built. So nature built arches down there long before we decided that was the way to build an arch. So it's, so it's kind of cool when we just when we found that and we built the model. It was like, wow, this is an arch. You know, and it ends up being perfect. So. What can we do with very old snow? You did, other than uh, you know, mill it, obviously, but yeah, it's it's, it's tough. Um, but one of one of the things that one of the things that we can do is keep some snow on the edges and pull it back together yep. if that's possible. And I know that's hard, but that's one of the tricks you can do is pull some of that old stuff in and mix it back in with the stuff that's all used up. Yep. And, and an, an example of that was, uh, or is, and again, I hate to keep going back to Antarctica, but I've looked at the snow there a lot, and they have the same problems. They get all this yeah. used up snow, and, there, and there's, a, there's a huge pad there that, that they, it's, it's a mile across, a big circular mile across pad that they do one particular study on, a big weather balloon goes off there. And they're having troubles with, with soft snow patches out there, or places where the vehicles would just fall right through. soft snow, so places in this huge pad where the snow's rotting from the bottom and they're falling through. Well, I was there, I said, hey, why don't you just take, you got a front end loader out here, go out there in the snow that's fresh snow, and it's surrounded by miles and miles of nothing yeah. of fresh snow, grab a couple buckets of snow, bring them in here, and, and stick them in the holes and mix in some of the old stuff with it, and boom, like a rock. So just that simple thing to mix that, that snow that's not all beat up and used up and crunched up and all kind of thing, mix it back in and then try and get, like I say, I know that's hard, but. Is there anything you use like a vibratory compactor, put it on the, on the back of the pan? Yeah, that's, that's what I was talking about before, that vibration will help you, it will yeah. always help, you know, and, and more and more drag are coming up, you know, so you see more and more drag on the trail now with vibrators. It's another piece of mechanical, you know, which is always trying, and, and welds crack, and not so much as, as far as actually breaking up crystals, but it's really good at getting the air out and getting the crystals to touch. Because if they'll touch, they'll sometimes they'll bond, even those big ones. I've heard people trying to put you know, some kind of like a propane heater on a, on a pan to heat it up. Yeah, it's very, very tough because um, it takes a lot of energy. Um, it takes tons of energy to get enough water out of the snow to get it to melt to itself. Yeah. So by the time you do it, I get those questions all the time, can't we just heat it up? We've actually even tried that in cases where you can move really, really slowly, and it just takes so much fuel and so much energy to do it that it's tough to do. Um, kind of why we don't see a whole lot of heated sidewalks, and the ones that we do are, old, are in millionaires' front yards, because um, it's it's relatively inexpensive to put that heated sidewalk in, but to run it's not so easy. So. <coughs> Your definition of old snow is in the fact that it's been sitting out on the side, getting warm it, by the it, sun and freezing and stuff. Yeah, that that. That will, it, it's still going to become snow that doesn't want to bond to itself, but not as quickly or as badly as the stuff that we keep breaking up and smashing up and dropping more water on. It. So, so it will help you to pull that stuff in, and and it'll sit there for a while before it becomes bad snow. And the other thing that happens, which is like I mentioned earlier, if we if, if we do have this corn snow thing happening, and, and 
do this if you ever want to play deep and you're out, and, you know, you can dig down to the snow and, and actually look, look at it. a piece of black felt the way, you know, grab a piece of black felt stick in your pocket, put those crystals on that black felt and look at them, especially through a magnifying glass. And they'll be those little pyramids, but they're very fragile. So if you just, if you just touch them, they will break. And if those crystals are off on the side, you now can mix those in with it. And, and you now have bulletproof, I mean, because it, it's, it's going to mix in all kinds of jagged stuff in between the rounded crystals, and they'll want to stick. So that stuff that's sitting over there, if it's three feet deep, it's rotting from the bottom up and becoming these really fragile crystals that are just kind of sitting on each other. Scoop them over, mix them in. And, and like I say, that's tough to do because you're now storing the snow that you'd rather have on the trail. But um, well, we run a, we run a huge test course at, at Michigan Tech, and, we're, and mostly vehicles, so we do analog brake systems and, and traction control systems and tires and all sorts of things, so it's many, many miles of road, and we do that. We store snow for it because people always want to test in April, and, and it, the test course tends to go to crap before then, so we, pull, we keep snow banks and we pull it over, but we can do that because we have lots of snow. So, but anytime you can store and pull in, that helps you. Push it off to the side. Has anybody ever tried? If you have a lot of snow on the trail, push it off to the side. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what we just build a little bank over there and eventually pull it back in again. And it tends to want to move to the outsides anyways. We start to build that up and we pull it back because it did move over there. So, so if you let some of it sit over there, sometimes you can keep it till spring and pull it back in, or keep it until it gets you haven't had snow for three weeks and everything's just to the point where you're pulling your hair out and it bumps up faster than you can ruin it. Thank you. Thank you.